I want to speak to us this morning on this topic right here. We're going to put it up on the screen. It says, do not or show, well, let's, let's not use proper English. Let's use my English. Don't spare the agag in your life. Don't spare the agag in your life. Now, some of you are looking at that title right now, and, and you're probably saying to yourself, I, what in the world, where is he going with this? But hopefully by the time that we're finished with this sermon this morning that we will all understand what it means to not spare the agag in our life. I want to share with you this morning, many of you guys probably got the email that we sent out. This Tuesday, this past Tuesday, September the 3rd, I was here at the church by myself. And I came into the sanctuary to spend some time in intercessory prayer. And I was laying right here on the floor And I was crying out to God, and I was saying, Lord, we've been praying for a supernatural breakthrough. We've been praying for your power to be released upon us. Lord, we want more of you. We want the power of God to show up in your church. And I was just praying that prayer, and then I just, you you ever do this when you're praying? You just decide to be silent for a while. And when I laid there silent, the Lord began to speak to me. And I hurried, and I got a piece of paper, and I wrote down the word of the Lord that he gave me this past Tuesday, September the 3rd, for our body right here. This is the word of the Lord. It says, a tearing down of strongholds must take place in the lives of my people before my spirit will be poured out upon them with signs and wonders. Strongholds removed in the lives of my people will release my power upon them to be the people I've called and anointed them to be, says the Lord. A tearing down of strongholds. For the release of the supernatural power of God in our lives. That's what today is about. Today is about a release of of strongholds in our lives, strongholds that we have coddled, strongholds that we have cuddled, strongholds that we've kept near and dear to us. But God is saying it's time to release it in Jesus' name. Anybody in here cold? Anybody freezing? Bump it up one degree. How's that? Because in a few minutes I'm going to be drenching up here. If you have your Bibles, turn with me to Exodus chapter 17. Remember, if you have your Bibles with you, some of you turn your Bibles on. Some of you open them up. Our Wi-Fi is down, so if you can't connect to Wi-Fi, that is the reason. Exodus chapter 17, in a few minutes, we're going to read verses 14 through 16. But before I read this scripture to you this morning, I want to kind of set the stage for you. I want to give you the backdrop of what's about to take place here. Exodus 17, Moses is leading the Israelites, God's people, out of Egypt. They are now on the move. They are coming out of Egypt. And as they are coming out of Egypt, a group of wicked people called the Amalekites attack God's people. And if you know the story in the Bible, as this attack comes upon the Israelites, By the Amalekites, that's a lot of ites, right? I get it, but let's just focus this morning. This is the battle in which which Moses went up on the mountaintop, and as long as he held his hands up in the air, the Israelites would win, were winning the battle. But when his hands would drop, the Amalekites would begin to overtake the Israelites. This is the story when two men by the name of Aaron and Hur go up onto the mountaintop, and each one of them take one of Moses' arms and lift them up in the air. And the Israelites overcome the Amalekites who have attacked God's people. The scripture that we're going to read right now is coming right off the cuffs of the battle of the Amalekites attacking the Israelites. Verse 14, it says, Then the Lord said to Moses, this is important, this is the, this is the crux of everything that we're going to talk about this morning. Then the Lord said to Moses, Write this on a scroll as something to be remembered and make sure that Joshua hears it because I will completely blot out the memory of Amalek from under heaven. 
Moses built an altar and called it, The Lord is my banner. He said, For hands were lifted up to the throne of the Lord. The Lord will be at war against the Amalekites from generation to generation. Now, depending on what version of the Bible you're reading, it may have said something like this. The Lord says, I will utterly and completely blot out the Amalekites from under heaven. I want you to understand that God is not happy with a group of wicked people that decided to attack his people. And God says, it's not going to happen today, but the day is coming where I am going to blot them out from under heaven. Bank on it. It's going to happen. I will utterly and completely remove Amalek and the Amalekites from under heaven. The Lord wasn't happy. Can I just say this really quick? God doesn't look too kindly on people attacking his people. When wicked people comes against God's people, God is going to have the last word. Vengeance is mine, saith the Lord. Isn't that what the scripture says? When, when you know, God was saying, write this on a scroll, it's going to happen. Now we're going to fast forward a couple hundred years from that time. And we're going to go to 1 Samuel chapter 15. Saul is the king of Israel. Samuel is the prophet of Israel at this time. This is a few hundred years since God says, I am going to blot out utterly and completely from under the heaven the Amalekites. And we're going to read here in 1 Samuel 15 verse 1 3, the word of the Lord comes to Samuel and God says, it's time. Today is the day. There's going to be a reconciliation that happens today. There's going to be, there's going to be something that's going to take place. And this is what the, the scripture says in 1 Samuel 15, 1 through 3. Samuel said to Saul, I am the one the Lord sent to anoint you king over the people of Israel. So listen now to the message from the Lord. This is what the Lord Almighty says. I will punish the Amalekites for what they did to Israel when they waylaid them when they came up out from Egypt. Now go, listen, now go, attack the Amalekites and totally destroy everything. Everybody say everything that belongs to them. Do not spare them. Put to death men, women, children, and infants, cattle and sheep, camels and donkeys. The Lord has spoken to the prophet Samuel. Samuel delivers the word of the Lord to Saul the king, and he says, it's time, muster the troops, get your men together. Today is going to happen. It's going to come to pass what the Lord said in Exodus. Get ready for it. Now, when some of us read this scripture, we're like, wow, God's serious here. He, he says in here, do not spare anything. Man, woman, boy, child, infant, cattle, donkey, sheep, do not spare any of them. I want you to understand that the Amalekites were a wicked, fleshly people that were a cancer. And God was saying, wipe them out. He gave Saul a very strict order not to spare nothing. So Saul pulls together some men. The scripture says that he gets 200,000 foot soldiers, 10,000 men from Judah, and Saul goes out on the journey to carry out that which the Lord has spoken to him. The scripture says that Saul attacks the Amalekites, and they begin to wipe out everyone. But he deviates from the word of the Lord. Let's read 1 Samuel 15, verse 9. But Saul and the army spared Agag, who is the king of the Amalekites, and the best of the sheep and cattle, the fat calves and the lambs, everything that was good. Good. Everything that was pleasing to the eye, they decided to keep and to spare. 
The scripture says, these they were unwilling to destroy completely. God gave Saul a word and he said, I want you to utterly and completely destroy this, get it out, destroy it, have nothing to do with it. But the scripture said that which was good, they were unwilling to destroy completely. Saul has almost obeyed the Lord. But I'm telling you this morning that our God is not an almost God. Verse 10 tells us the word of the Lord came to Samuel, and the Lord says, I am grieved that I have made Saul king because he has turned from me and he has not carried out my instructions. I'm going somewhere with this. I want you guys to stay tuned in, please. So the Lord sends Samuel back to Saul. And I'm going to read what what it says here, starting at verse 17. We're going to read through 23. Samuel said, although you were once small in your own eyes, did you not become the head of the tribes of Israel? The Lord anointed you king over Israel. And he sent you on a mission saying, go and completely destroy those wicked people, the Amalekites. Make war on them until you have wiped them out. Why did you not obey the Lord? Why did you pounce on the plunder and do evil in the eyes of the Lord? Saul replied, but I did obey the Lord. I went on the mission the Lord assigned me. I completely destroyed the Amalekites and brought back Agag, their king. The soldiers took sheep and cattle from the plunder, the best of what was devoted to God in order to sacrifice them to the Lord your God at Gilgag. But Samuel replied, and we all know this scripture, does the Lord delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as much as in obeying the voice of the Lord? Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice, and to heed is better than the fat of the rams. For rebellion is like the sin of witchcraft, and arrogance like the evil of idolatry. Because you have rejected the word of the Lord, he has rejected you as king. Now let's talk about this for a minute. Because we can, some of us could read this and we could say, wow. God was harsh on Samuel or, or Saul. I mean, he, all, he, he, he did probably about 98% of what God told him to do, but yet because he did not do it completely, he lost his influence. He lost his kingship. It was going to be removed from him. He spared Agag, who was the king of these wicked Amalekites. Why would Saul do that? Why would he do that? God says, don't spare anyone, nothing. Even infants he told Saul to destroy. Yeah, I'm sure there were infants that he, they did destroy, but yet he spared Agag, the king of the wicked Amalekites. I want to talk about Agag for a minute because we we have to understand this. I want to make this analogy this morning. Agag, obviously we know, is the king of the Amalekites. The Amalekites were descendants of Esau. Let's go back and talk about Esau for a second. Esau is the man who sold his birthright for a bowl of stew to please his flesh. He was willing to do whatever he had to do. He traded walking in the blessings of God for a lifetime to please his flesh for the moment. Agag today for this message is an analogy for the flesh. Because the Amalekites were a people that lived to please the flesh. 
they were a people far away from God. They were a people who did what they wanted to do, when they wanted to do it, to please themselves for the moment. And Saul disobeys God and brings King Agag back to them. I've almost done everything that God asked me to do. But I spared Agag. I want to ask you this morning, how many followers of Christ walk in the same ways of Saul where they almost do everything that God wants them to do? They go to church week in and week out, they show up for, for missions. They show up for ministry opportunities. They do everything, almost everything that God wants them to do, but they've spared a little agag for themselves, something that pleases them, something that pleases the flesh, something that they like to do that nobody else knows about, but they've held on to it. That's agag, my friend. If you've got a hidden stronghold in your life that is Agag rearing his head, and we cannot spare Agag in our lives today. If we want to see the power of God move in our lives, it's time that we bring Agag up and get rid of him. It reminds me of the young man who's passionately seeking the Lord, who prays reads his word, comes to church, tries to live right, but has spared that time and moment where nobody else knows about when he gets in front of the computer screen or holds his phone and looks at filth on it to please his flesh. That's Agag, my friend. That's Agag. It reminds me of the person who's passionately seeking God but won't turn down an opportunity to share some juicy gossip with those around them. That's Agag, my friend. You ever been around somebody like that? Every time they were around somebody, they were wanting, hey, hey, let me tell you what I heard. And if we're not careful, we'll get sucked into them. Oh, yeah, what, what, to give, 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 tell me, tell me. What is it? Well, I'm only going to tell you this. I'm going to tell you this, Glory, but you got to promise not to tell anybody else. Oh, I'm not going to tell anybody. I would never do that. And you take that juicy information and you go and you say, Drake, you're not going to believe what I hear, but you've got to promise me that you're not going to tell anybody. Dad, I would never tell anybody. Listen to this. And then he goes and he goes over to mom. Mom, you're not going to believe what dad just told me, but you got to promise. And before too long, you've got 30 people that have got gossip going around. And what does the Bible say about gossip? That's Agag, my friend, rearing his head up in our lives and in our flesh. You plug in the scenario that you want. Because whether we want to admit to it or not, all of us are covered in this stuff called flesh. And there's a battle going on, and we can almost do everything that God wants us to do, but many of us are hanging on to a small portion, just like Saul did, Hang on to a small portion that we enjoy doing. But the scripture says that it's unholy. Think about that for a second. Are you willing to lose your greatest influence because of an agag in your life? Are you willing to trade an anointing for Agag? Listen, you can't cuddle with Agag. You can't be friends with Agag. You can't live 98% and keep coddling Agag for yourself because it brings pleasure to your flesh. You know what the scripture says? Samuel goes back with Saul. 
we read this in uh, 1 Samuel chapter 15, verse 32 and 33. He goes back with Saul, and he says, bring me Agag. And the Bible says that King Agag comes to Samuel, read it, in confidence because he's like, the threat of death is over. But the Bible says that this prophet of the Lord, as Agag comes, what does he say? Verse 32, 33. Then Samuel said, bring me Agag, king of the Amalekites. Agag came to him, what? Confidently, thinking surely the bitterness of death is past. But Samuel said, as your sword has made women childless, so will your mother be childless among women. And Samuel put Agag to death before the Lord at Gilgag. Depending on what version your Bible says, one version says he hacked him to pieces in front of the Lord. The prophet Samuel, bring Agag to me because I'm going to show you what you got to do with Agag. He hacked him to pieces Before the Lord. What Samuel or what Saul wasn't willing to do, the prophet of the Lord had to do it for him. And because Saul was not willing to do it, he lost his kingship and he lost his influence. He lost the favor of God because he was not willing to destroy Agag. What are we holding on to? What agag do we keep hidden in our lives that doesn't give us the full favor of God because we are coddling it and hugging it and enjoying sin for a season for the uh, the pleasure of it? Boy, you guys are quiet in here this morning. Somebody say amen. Somebody say preach it. When will the body of Christ be the body of Christ? I will tell you when. When we get to the place where we stop patting Agag on the back, when we stop snuggling up to him in our bed, when we stop keeping him right by our side as our friend, and we get to the place where we hack him to pieces and say, Jesus, I love you more than I love Agag. I love you more than the pleasure that Agag gives me. I want to passionately pursue you, and instead of spending time with Agag, I want to spend time with you in the secret place. That's why we're not seeing signs and wonders, because we coddle Agag instead of letting Jesus Meet us in the secret place. Do do you know that Agag will keep you from going in the secret place? When you've been hanging out with Agag, when you've been hanging out with Agag, you don't want to go to the secret place because there's there's guilt and shame. Guilt and shame keeps you from going to the secret place. Amen? Amen? What happens is we know what we need to do, but we're enjoying the pleasures of sin. We don't want, who wants to go meet God for for a sit-down chat when you've been hanging out with Agag? That ain't a comfortable talk, my friend. You think it's a bad day when you were growing up and you you know you made some serious mistakes and your mom or your dad found out and they said, "Uh, you need to come home right now. We're going to have us a little chat. I've been there before, rut row. This ain't going to be good. Who wants to meet God in the secret place when you've been hanging out with Agag? Who wants to meet God in the secret place when you've been looking at porn that your wife doesn't even know about? Who wants to hang out with Agag when you've been, who wants to hang out with God in the secret place when you've been hanging out with Agag? It doesn't, nobody wants to do it, my friend. Because they know that a conversation is going to have to take place. Right? They know the uncomfortableness that's, got to, that's going to happen. They know they've been there a hundred times before saying, God, forgive me for hanging out with Agag. And the enemy tells them, you can't go back and keep asking. Because you've been hanging out with Agag and you keep telling God that you're going to get rid of him. But you don't. You know what repentance is, my friends? I'm going to give you this analogy. 
This is repentance. You're on Interstate 75 and you're going north. And you realize you're going the wrong way. I want to go, I want to go south. Well, who keeps going north when you know you need to go south? Repentance is you exit and you make a complete turnaround and you start going in the opposite direction. That's what repentance is. You get on 75 south and you start going that way. The problem with us today is we want to go, into, go down to an altar and say, Lord, forgive me for hanging out with Agag. I want you to forgive me, but I ain't going to get rid of him. I'm not going to start going in the other direction. I'm going to keep him next to me. Is that repentance? No. That is not repentance. That is not a change in the heart. That is you feel guilty for hanging out with Agag, and, and, and you ask God to forgive you, but you go right back and hang out with him again. It means nothing. It holds no weight with God until you exit and get on and go on a completely different direction. Some of you may be sitting in here this morning saying, Pastor, what are you trying to say? Are you trying to tell me that I'm not saved? Are you trying to tell me that I'm not a Christian? I'm not on my way to heaven? That's not what I'm saying this morning. What I'm saying is that as long as you continue, continue to keep Agag in your life, you are not going to walk in the fullness of the power and the influence and the anointing that God has designed and called you to walk in. And I don't know about you, but I'm not willing to sacrifice that for Agag. If God wants to pour out an anointing upon my life to, to, to preach the gospel of Jesus everywhere I go, everywhere my feet take me, and he wants to, to pour out himself so he can be glorified through signs and wonders, who would not want that in their life? Who would trade that for Agag? It's time, ladies and gentlemen, that we come to a place just like Samuel and we say to ourselves, Agag, and let me tell you, the Agag in your life is sitting next to you right now and he is confident, just like Agag was in the Bible. There is no fear of death in Agag in your life right now because we have coddled him and hung out with him for years and years. We've told him to go, but we never opened the door. We've kept him right there next to us and he's, no, he's not fearful at all. But we've got to come to the place where we say, Agag, today is the day, my friend. And hack him to pieces before the Lord, as Samuel did before the Lord. Turn with me to Romans. Listen, I, didn't, I came here this morning to provoke you, not stroke you. The Lord wants to provoke us in the spirit. It's time that men and women of God who preach and teach the gospel start preaching truth in these last days and not tickling our ears of what we want to hear. I ain't getting a whole lot of amens. Romans chapter 13. I want to read this, Pastor Chris, if you'd come on up and get yourself ready, please. I, I, I only want Pastor Chris to come up this morning, if that's okay. Romans 13, starting in verse 11. And do this, understanding the present time. The hour has come for you to wake up from your slumber. 
Man, it's time for the body of Christ to wake up. Stop being lazy. It's time for us to wake up and stop being lazy in the spirit realm. Because our salvation is nearer now than when we first believed. The night is nearly over. The day is almost here. So let us put aside the deeds of darkness and put on the armor of light. Let us behave decently as in the daytime, not in orgies and drunkenness, not in sexual immorality and debauchery. Let me just stop there for a second because in this last day there is such a spirit of lust that has been released upon this nation. It has been released out of the spirit of lust is coming against everyone. When the scripture says not to have anything to do with sexual morality, that spirit of lust that comes against everyone, it's time to hack it to pieces. It's time to stop entertaining thoughts in our head. It's time to stop looking at certain things. It's time to put away and hack it up. Not in dissension and jealousy, but listen, rather... Clothe yourself with the Lord Jesus Christ. And do not think about how to gratify the desires of the sinful nature. The scripture says, rather, let's clothe ourselves with the Lord Jesus. And let's stop trying to figure out ways to gratify what? The flesh for the sinful nature. That right there is saying it's time to hack up Agag. I believe that many of us in here know exactly who the Agag is in our life right now. And I believe that with all the fasting and the praying that we've been doing, I wholeheartedly believe the word of the Lord that he spoke to me as I was laying here in prayer the other, the other day, saying, when my people will come to the place where there is a releasing of strongholds and, and it's, it's, it's gone, then, that's what the scripture says, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray, turn from their wicked ways, then, then, folks, God is positioning, God is positioning his church for these last days, for those who have ears to hear. If you read in the book of Revelation, for every one of the churches that the word of the Lord came, it said, for, hear for those who have ears to hear. The problem is many of our churches in our, in our society today don't have ears to hear what the Lord is saying. I am more convinced now than ever before that God is going to bring a releasing of strongholds into the lives of the people who are willing to hack Agag to pieces. I believe that God is going to start positioning this church, his church. He's going to bring people in that are ready to, to, to do business in the last days of God, who are ready to go out into this lost and dying world that will preach the gospel, that will be Jesus, that will be the hands and feet of Jesus, who are no longer interested in hanging out with Agag, but doing the will of the Father. And I believe that God is going to start making divine appointments and bringing people into his house.
Are we ready for it? Are we ready to hack up Agag? Are we ready to, to walk in the, in the, in, with the influence of God in our lives? Are we ready to step out of the boat and do things that we wouldn't normally do? Are we ready? Let me give you this testimony. Come on up here, sis. Come here. Let me give you this testimony. This, this, is, this is to glorify God. Friday I was at the track walking, trying to lose some of this fatness. And I walked the track a couple times. And I stopped at my car to get a bottle of water. And I was guzzling this water, standing under a shade tree. And I saw this young woman walking towards me on the track. And the Holy Spirit overcame me. And he said, I have a calling on this young woman's life and an anointing on her life to preach the gospel to women. And he said, you need to tell her that. And I said, God, I'm a married man. I don't, appro- I don't approach young women on the track. She's going to think this old, bald-headed white dude's trying to, to, to bust a move on her. So I just kept, I just put my water bottle down and I, and I kept walking. And and, and, and a few minutes later, I heard some footsteps behind me. And I heard what I thought was music coming from the phone, from the footsteps. But as it got closer, I heard a woman preaching the gospel. And God said to me, I told you that woman is called to preach the gospel to women. And this woman said, she was preaching about intimacy with God. Have we not been preaching about that here at church? And the Lord says, open your mouth. And we're walking side by side. And I said, that's a good word right there, intimacy. And and, and next thing I know, we were a mile into the track. Man, I'm telling you, I, 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 this was so goes beyond anything that I'm comfortable of doing. But we were talking Jesus. And the power of God fell on this young lady. And she began to weep and cry because she knows the call that God has on her life. She knows that God's not finished, that it's just getting started. It's just getting started. The journey is just beginning, sis, what he's doing in your life. And I said to her, I said, where do you go to church at? She goes, well, right now I'm looking for a church. I said, good, because I know where one is. And she's here today. And Gloria, you know that God has called you to preach the gospel of Jesus. And what you think that the enemy has done in your life has been bad, God is going to turn around. And he's going to give you the most powerful testimony for women that need to hear what you have walked through and how God has brought you through it. In Jesus' name. Amen? Amen. This girl's going to be preaching. There are hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of Glorias out there that need somebody to just step up and just say, hey, this is the word of the Lord. There are women in this church, Gloria, that have the gift of the prophetic, that have worship gifts, singing gifts, and they're your sisters in Christ. They will come alongside you. They will love you and your son. They will continue to help mentor you in your walk with Christ. God is positioning his body for last days pouring out of the Holy Spirit which Joel prophesied about and I don't know about you but I want it I want it I want it more I want it more than the breath that I breathe I want the outpouring of God's Holy Spirit more than I want Agag in my life
bow with me. Father, I have preached that which you have laid upon my heart this morning to deliver to us, your people. And I pray, Lord, that your word would penetrate our hearts. That your Holy Spirit would convict our hearts. That we would take that spiritual sword in our hand this morning as a sign of surrendering Agag to the Lordship of Jesus Christ. Today, we will hack Agag to pieces before the Lord at second chance. If you are here today and God is speaking to you and he's saying, today I want you to hack Agag to pieces. I want you to get out of your seat. I want you to come down to this altar right now and I want you to kneel at this place and I want you to do business with God right now. There should not be anybody in a seat because none of us are perfect. If God is speaking to you, get up, come down to this altar right now and say, Lord, I am here to do business with you. Agag will no longer live in my life. Today, I will hack Agag to pieces before the Lord at your altar. I am ready to there to be a loosening of strongholds. Father, in the name of Jesus, we rebuke strongholds right now. Strongholds in the flesh, be gone in Jesus' name. Depression, gone in Jesus' name. Anxiety, gone in Jesus' name. Lust, gone in Jesus' name. Porn, gone in Jesus' name. Father, we cry out to you this morning for a releasing of strongholds in the spirit realm so that signs and wonders would be poured out upon your people in these last days. We are tired of business as usual. We want more of you. We mean business today. We cry out to you. We seek you right now, Father, in the name of Jesus for a releasing of strongholds in our lives in Jesus' name. Come on, church. Cry out to him right now. Cry out to him right now. A releasing is about to overcome us right now in Jesus' name.